Hello, welcome to a uh, lecture presentation on surgical pathology of the large bowel. We're going to start this uh, in a couple of parts, and uh, for today, uh, our objectives are to uh, essentially uh, focus on inflammatory uh, colonic diseases and how to interpret them in biopsy setting. Uh, we'll also uh, talk a little bit about some of the follow-up uh, process and surveillance uh, issues that associate a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, in doing so, perhaps uh, you may identify areas uh, in your own practice where processes can be improved. So first of all, I think it's important to understand why the colon is being biopsied. Uh, this uh, makes a tremendous difference in how we approach the slides. Uh, and how we think about our uh, diagnosis and our uh, recommendations, if any. So there are a variety of reasons why a clinician may want to uh, biopsy the colon. Uh, the exam may be a routine screening exam as the patient reaches a sufficiently mature age that uh, malignancy is a, uh, a possibility. Uh, they may be uh, searching to evaluate a cause for anemia in a patient with iron deficiency. The patient may have uh, diarrhea, chronic or otherwise, or they may have had blood in their stool. Uh, they may have abdominal pain or some other symptom, maybe a radiographic finding only. Um, some patients we see because uh, they have a family history. And, and then sometimes about all you get uh, from some of the clinicians is, well, I saw this and I wanted to see what it was. So uh, it's important as we look at these to understand and remember uh, the variations that can occur in, from site to site with uh, normal uh, colonic mucosa. Uh, there are certain things that are predictable. Cellularity overall will decrease as we move towards the uh, distal colon. PANF cells uh, are present in the ascending colon as well as the small bowel, but not usually present elsewhere. And then, of course, uh, the crypt lengths and sort of thickness of the mucosa also tends to be uh, a little bit more variable and uh, may be more attenuated in the rectum. Likewise, the eosinophils and lymphoid aggregates uh, can vary according to location and age as well. So uh, where are these from? Uh, well, this one at the lower right, we might say, look at how these are not quite reaching the uh, muscularis mucosa. These are a little bit short. There's not very much inflammation here. I bet this is the rectum, uh, and you'd be right. Here we see a few more cells, uh, a few more lymphocytes, a few more eosinophils, um, and if you maybe exaggerate a little bit, you might even see a pan cell. So this is probably ascending colon. And here we're sort of in between. We don't have pan cells. We have a modest cellularity. So somewhere in the mid-colon. Other things to remember that uh, can be uh, variations, uh, and that uh, would include the things on this list uh, taken from uh, the wonderful GI path textbook by uh, doctors uh, Odes and company. Uh, we can see atrophy of the crypts, some branching occasionally, uh, clumping lymphocytes occasionally seen, uh, lymphoid aggregates, uh, crypt regenerative changes, surface degenerative changes, and uh, even some neutrophils, occasionally neutrophils within the epithelium, uh, particularly near lymphoid aggregates. And then uh, sort of pseudolipomatosis, air vacuoles, is an artifact of uh, the uh, endoscopy and biopsy procedure. So let's uh, look at our roadmap for today. We're going to talk about the big two, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis, and much of our time is going to be spent there. And then we'll uh, move on down to cover a few of the other items uh, in uh, uh, least superficial detail. The idea is to give you a scope of understanding of these benign biopsies uh, and what to uh, be thinking about as you look at them. So the first question uh, with colitis is, uh, do we have colitis? Is it inflammatory disease? Uh, and then the second question is, is there activity? In other words, is there evidence of acute inflammation within the epithelium? Is there evidence of epithelial damage? Um, now, the most uh, salient feature to detect uh, colitis is uh, usually crypt distortion. That indicates that there has been damage, um, and that would indicate that there's some chronicity to things. 
Uh, the next thing to be thinking about uh, is uh, basal plasma cytosis. Um, and uh, that uh, can be variable, uh, but it, as it tends to obscure the uh, muscularis mucosa, you can begin to believe that it's uh, more significant. And then we've already talked about uh, activity. So uh, here are the features to be thinking about, crypt distortion, plasma cytosis, uh, mixed inflammation, uh, deep lymphoid aggregates uh, that uh, obscure the muscularis, uh, any degree of metaplasia, such as paneth cell metaplasia or pyloric metaplasia, uh, fibrosis, collagen deposition, and uh, potentially thickening of the muscularis mucosa, and then finally granuloma is uh, not always seen. Uh, activity, uh, loss of epithelium, epithelial regeneration, hemorrhage, necrosis, ulceration, fissuring, uh, neutrophils that are intraepithelial, the same for eosinophils, and then areas of apoptosis or uh, cell death. So uh, that would uh, leave us with a number of sort of options, uh, and uh, here are sort of uh, a couple of uh, pathways to think about. Uh, with chronic uh, infl inflammation in the colon, you can think about preserved or not preserved architecture. Same with acute. Uh, is it ischemic or hemorrhagic, or is it not hemorrhagic and ischemic? Eosinophilic and so-called posicellular. Now, these are the differentials to consider with these various patterns, but one thing I want you to note is that IBD occurs in every single box on this list. So inflammatory bowel disease is always in the differential, if it were. Um, it may not always be at the same stage or same degree of severity or significance, but it's always in the differential with any of these patterns. Uh, and then you can come back and look at these uh, at your leisure uh, when you uh, are thinking about things. So ulcerative colitis uh, clinically usually uh, comes on in early adulthood. Um, maybe adolescence, uh, it certainly is widely variable geographically. Um, but now as uh, diet and biomes change, as uh, the world gets flatter, so to speak, uh, we are seeing it uh, occur in previously low incidence areas like Asia and so forth. Uh, there are certain genetic susceptibilities and of course uh, one's environment, activities, uh, and various infectious exposures also influence uh, the development of this disease. Uh, we usually think of it being primarily colonic, but there are some extra intestinal manifestations of ulcerative colitis that include uh, erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrenosum, and so forth, uh, episcleritis and uveitis in the eyes, and even some uh, arthropathies uh, such as ankylosing spondylitis, spondylitis and in the liver, uh, sclerosing cholangitis, uh, of course, is associated with uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, host factors, genetic susceptibility, immune function, all of these uh, play a role in interacting with the uh, enteric uh, microbiome and the antigens that are being presented uh, and seem to be uh, related to the, to the pathogenesis. So grossly, uh, we tend to have uh, uh, some degree of uh, continuity throughout uh, with uh, uh, maybe more proximal sparing as you approach the ileocecal valve. Uh, generally, the more distal you go, the, the worse the involvement is with uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, but there are on occasion uh, so-called little areas of rectal sparing. Uh, under the microscope, uh, the activity can vary quite markedly. Uh, but as you see here, very little, just a single crypt abscess here, uh, whereas here you've got uh, destruction of the crypt, regenerative changes going on, and, and here somewhere something in between. Uh, so the uh, low magnification view is usually uh, the best place to start uh, because that's when you can best answer the question, does this really look like colitis? Um, and then you can begin to pick out at low power these areas like, oh, here, maybe something's fallen out, or maybe there's something going on here, or look at this uh, crypt that's been partially disrupt disrupted. Um, and that's where you can begin to suspect uh, that there may be something more specific going on. Uh, but at low power, you should be able to identify branching crypts. You should be able to identify the in inflammatory infiltrate, uh, shortening of the crypts, 
and potentially even areas of uh, active uh, crypt damage. Uh, in terms of architectural distortion, the things that qualify uh, are, of course, branching. We've mentioned that and shortening. Uh, irregular contours, though, as well, like this. So this sort of narrowing with a little budding out uh, sort of appearance. Uh, here's a branched one. Uh, and then areas where suddenly the crypts have just disappeared. You have very few sorts of changes. Um, the most common uh, things that sort of masquerade as IBD are chronic ischemia, uh, usually related to radiation, and some sort of persistent uh, or recurrent clostridium. Uh, because those can, can cause architectural distortion, uh, but not be in the setting of uh, IBD. And of course, uh, we can find granulomas uh, most commonly in uh, Crohn's colitis, but uh, occasionally in ulcerative colitis, uh, you'll get uh, foreign body material and a pericrypt uh, granuloma, particularly if there's been any of that foreign material in there that's going to provoke a granulomatous reaction. Um, as I mentioned, rectal sparing is unusual, and any skip areas that appear normal endoscopically may actually um, be uninvolved. Importantly here, though, uh, rectum-limited disease does have a lower risk of uh, dysplasia eventually. Now, as treatment uh, uh, is becoming more and more successful, uh, we occasionally are seeing these uh, resolution phases where uh, we don't see any <clears throat> crypt abscesses at all, uh, less neutrophils and so forth, and the crypts begin to regenerate. And under certain uh, highly effective treatments, uh, we may end up with almost normal uh, appearing. Uh, however, there is a, a stage at which uh, the, in surveillance, they get follow-up biopsies, and uh, there's evidence that there has been colitis, uh, but yet uh, it's not, uh, uh, there's no degree of activity. Uh, and that's characterized by the situation where there's just very sparse inflammation and we have some degree of distorted architecture, um, but no intraepithelial uh, crypt abscesses uh, or acute neutrophilic inflammation. Um, at a very minimum, there needs to be some degree of either crypt variability, branching, shortening, uh, to uh, use the term quiescent uh, chronic colitis. Uh, you want to be careful with that term, however, because uh, you certainly don't want to uh, imply uh, that an area that uh, may be otherwise normal uh, was once inflamed if it was not, uh, because that certainly will change their perception of the risk of uh, dysplasia and the areas that may be subjected to surveillance um, endoscopy and uh, frequent biopsies. Certain atypical uh, presentations with ulcerative colitis can be uh, identified, um, particularly if uh, patients are using steroids for some uh, purpose, especially uh, highly potent steroids. Um, presenting on the left side with backwash ileitis or other sorts of things, or rarely uh, upper uh, GI tract involvement uh, are all atypical uh, circumstances where occasionally uh, the best diagnosis is ulcerative colitis. And of course, in differentiating these two, uh, the classic features we use to differentiate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease is continuous diffuse disease versus segmental, uh, so-called regional enteritis, as it used to be called. Uh, rectal involvement is uh, nearly universal in ulcerative colitis, uh, but quite variable in Crohn's. Um, progressively worse uh, disease distally uh, and uh, highly variable with Crohn's disease. Fissuring ulceration are, uh, is not usually seen with ulcerative colitis, whereas that's uh, classic uh, for Crohn's disease, uh, as well as the developing development of fistula tracts and the sinuses and so forth. Uh, the lack of any transmural inflammation, although this is not something you're going to be able to detect on biopsy, uh, and the presence of uh, adventitial serosal lymphoid aggregates. Um, and then uh, upper GI tract involvement, uh, terminal ileal involvement uh, is the norm uh, with Crohn's disease and not with uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, 
The granulomatous uh, inflammation is only due to crypt rupture, whereas uh, epithelioid granulomas may be present unrelated to crypts uh, in both the uh, submucosa as well as the uh, adventitia and regionally draining lymph nodes. Um, now that's in the naive state. Once you start uh, treatment, um, then the uh, distinctions become uh, quite a bit um, more subtle. Um, and so uh, you see after treatment, you note here uh, diffuse disease, rectal involvement. Those are all kind of plus minus, much like Crohn's disease. Um, and ileal involvement can be variable. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, differential, once you start treatment here, uh, can be very difficult. Um, very few uh, um, definitive uh, features uh, once that uh, has moved into the consideration. So let's talk about uh, Crohn's enterocolitis. Uh, it's not just Crohn's colitis, it uh, uh, infects the entire, uh, affects the entire uh, GI tract and obviously other sites as well on occasion. About a third have only small bowel involvement, about a third have ileocolic involvement, and uh, you know, a lower percentage have only the colon involved. Um, again, it's a multifactorial, uh, environmental, genetic, um, and uh, exposure. Uh, grossly, their features tend to be a little bit different. Uh, you tend to have more furrowing uh, ulcerations um, and uh, pseudopolyp formation with uh, uh, Crohn's disease. Um, but here again, you see that this could be uh, progressive disease. Uh, this is uh, in this situation, the rectum is spared, um, and this is uh, what we're seeing here distally. Um, on the biopsies, the uh, activity can be quite variable. Uh, even in a, a group of uh, biopsies from, say, the left colon or transverse colon, some will be involved and some may not. Uh, and you can see here areas of uh, uh, gla uh, in periglandular uh, inflammation, some crypt damage, um, and uh, areas of uh, fibrin deposition. Um, acute neutrophilic damage and uh, histocytic granulomas are uh, frequently the norm. Uh, here you see the intraepithelial uh, neutrophils that you expect to see with crypt damage, and here a subsurface, sub, uh, subepithelial uh, histiocyte cluster. Uh, now that may not look very much like a granuloma, but as uh, Dr. Compton used to say, you know, whenever two or three histiocytes go walking, that's a granuloma. Um, and the ulcerations can be either surface aphthous type or as you see here, the more fissuring type of ulceration uh, involving a, a crypt. With uh, Crohn's disease, you tend to more frequently get uh, pyloric type metaplasia rather than PANF cell metaplasia, um, but uh, they can be seen in either one. Uh, and both of these are, of course, markers of cr chronic damage and regenerative changes. So what do we do when we don't know what it is? Uh, well, uh, there are a number of cases where uh, you've seen the entire bowel, um, you've examined things thoroughly, and you still can't say. However, every effort should be made to not use this category of indeterminate colitis or indeterminate inflammatory bowel disease um, as the final diagnosis. Uh, because usually if we've got uh, a, a good depth of information about sites of involvement, clinical course, and so forth, um, the, we should be able to assign that to uh, uh, one camp or the other, especially uh, if you've got the whole bowel in your, in your hands. Uh, however, there are certain cases such as fulminant pan colitis uh, that can be uh, very difficult to classify. Uh, but usually, if that's the case, it's usually UC that has some atypical features. So in reality, this uh, sort of indeterminate colitis uh, is sort of a, uh, uh, a holding category, not a, a final diagnosis, uh, if at all possible. So here's an example. Well, on a single biopsy, a single field, of course, it's very difficult to classify. Uh, here we've got glandular distortion, we've got a little bit of activity, uh, maybe we've got some clusters of histiocytes, but maybe not. Um, it, it can be very difficult. Um, 
And so what do we think about when we have uh, abnormal crypt architecture and that sort of hyaline material here that we were seeing here, uh, this stuff? Is it histiocytes or is it something else? Uh, well, um, one th consideration is that we may have um, IBD, uh, but we might also have things like chronic ischemia, or we might be looking at a radiation-induced change, or we might have a, a prolapse uh, as well. Um, and so looking at some of these differential features, um, this is uh, some of the, these are some of the considerations. Now these should be able to be separated. Um, chronic ischemia may or may not have uh, withering crypts, but probably would be more likely to have some degree of that. Uh, may have more IBD-like inflammation. Um, uh, usually would not have vascular dilatation or vascular proliferation, uh, whereas that might be more commonly seen with radiation. Um, uh, this hyaline material is fairly common and can be seen with radiation, but would not usually be seen in a prolapse type polyp, a solitary rectal ulcer or something of that sort. Whereas hyperplastic changes uh, quite frequently are seen with prolapse uh, and in at times can even mimic a hyperplastic polyp or even an adenomatous polyp with regenerative atypia. So uh, those are uh, some of the things, the factors to be looking at. Now let's tackle the challenging topic of uh, dysplasia. Uh, in fact, the overall risk of dysplasia in inflammatory bowel disease is pretty similar between uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease um, based on uh, cumulative uh, years of, of risk. Uh, and so uh, while with Crohn's disease, you know, the relative risks have been calculated at two and a half to five and a half or so. Uh, with ulcerative colitis, it's a progressively increasing risk over time as each successive year of uh, disease uh, progresses. That may have changed somewhat as our ability to control the inflammatory process has improved over time. Um, and we might wanna look at that uh, data again uh, in a year or two to see uh, what the, the has, what, what sort of a change we've uh, induced on the uh, incidence curve. Uh, in general, dysplasia uh, that is of greatest concern is the flat dysplasia. However, if they have an elevated lesion or so, sort of diffu um, um, dysplasia associated lesion or mass, that's what DALM stands for, uh, some sort of a lesion that is visually identifiable, uh, that can be often managed more typically uh, as we would adenomas or other types of mass lesions. Uh, but dysplasia can also be multifocal and, uh, <clears throat> and so forth. We use a grading scheme of negative, indeterminate, low grade, high grade. Uh, but as we have uh, learned in other sites, the uh, challenge with uh, concordance uh, between pathologists is still uh, pretty significant here. Significant here. Uh, we will look for a, a future video to uh, talk about uh, grading dysplasia and provide you some uh, study examples. Uh, so here's uh, an example. Which of these is dysplasia? Well, uh, here we see a lot of blue material, but we don't have surface. One of the things we'd like to see is what's going on on the surface. And so we don't usually grade dysplasia just based on what's in the crypt. Uh, likewise, uh, here's some abnormal architecture, but as we look at the surface, it looks relatively bland. And there may be that there's ac active inflammation here. We don't like to grade dysplasia uh, when there's active inflammation. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, is this dysplasia? Uh, here we're out on the surface. We don't seem to have um, uh, active inflammation. We're seeing some columnar change uh, in this epithelium as opposed to the more normal stuff over here. So this may be low-grade dysplasia. Uh, you can see the challenge here. Uh, here's another example. Which of these uh, is uh, dysplasia? Well, uh, if we have both architectural changes and cytologic changes, that's easy. Uh, it's when we just have a little bit uh, or just one and not the other uh, that it becomes more challenging uh, for us. There are a number of other issues to think about, uh, but the most important things I think to remember are look at the nuclei. Uh, 
uh, are they becoming stratified and pencil shaped as opposed to rounded? Um, are there architectural changes? Um, and these are, these are the differences that help us with low grade versus high grade. Uh, you want to grade based on the area of highest degree of atypia. Um, and then sometimes people say, well, how much? How much high grade do I need before it's high grade? Is one crypt good? Is uh, one, one little uh, pseudopolyp uh, good? Um, the, uh, occasionally, uh, immunohistochemistry has been touted as being able to help you, uh, such as looking for TP53, uh, staining and up, uh, uptick. Uh, that may be helpful. Racemase uh, has been occasionally touted. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, I don't think there's uh, very many people who place uh, all their bets here. Uh, they tend to look a lot at the morphology and to evaluate on that basis. Um, indefinite for dysplasia, that's usually uh, secondary to inflammation, um, but sometimes it may just be negative with inflammation and reactive atypia, or is it low grade? And so, so these uh, conflicts and challenges uh, can become part of the challenge or part of the reason why this uh, area uh, has become uh, an area for subspecialists in many circumstances. But if you are seeing these in your practice and you're seeing these in your education, you need to become familiar with them. So uh, as we've mentioned, the follow-up can be different. Uh, if you have flat dysplasia, uh, the follow-up for these is usually beginning, is gonna go to co total colectomy, uh, especially if you have flat high-grade dysplasia uh, because a, a large number of those will have invasive uh, neoplasia. Um, in terms of uh, detection, uh, usually, we're talking about beginning uh, surveillance uh, somewhere eight to 10 years uh, post uh, uh, diagnosis. And they're going to do uh, multiple biopsies at every 10 centimeter interval um, uh, to evaluate for the presence of occult dysplasia. It's not perfect, uh, but uh, it's intended to detect uh, the lesions before they become invasive. Um, in terms of uh, the, the mass lesions, uh, these can usually be managed the way polyps would be managed. In terms of follow-up, um, if there's no dysplasia, they're going to get repeat colonoscopy on a semi-annual, biannual basis. If we're looking at something that's indefinite, probably negative, well, they may get repeat colonoscopy and sampling within a short, short period, six to 12 months whereas uh, favor positive more frequently. If they've got low-grade low dysplasia, again, we've mentioned that goes to uh, uh, lesion, to uh, polyp-like management. But if it's flat dysplasia, um, very often, even if it's low-grade, that will go to colectomy. But in some circumstances, they will uh, repeat colonoscopy frequently at six-month intervals to confirm uh, or uh, cycle the patient more frequently there if the patient's a high surgical risk. But flat dysplasias, high grade, those are gonna all go to colectomy if the patient's a suitable surgical candidate. And here we go, uh, another uh, sort of algorithm to look at uh, the low grade lesions or the mass lesions, excuse me, uh, followed up like a, a polyp, um, polypectomy. Uh, but if it's a non-adenoma-like mass, say maybe more like a sessile serrated adenoma that has a slight mass lesion, but not necessarily um, the, the berry type of polyp, uh, those patients may need to, to get colectomy or segmental resection. So uh, the detailed matters in terms of surveillance, um, this has been uh, published by the American Gastroenterology Association. Um, and those patients who have um, disease get follow-up about eight years after onset of symptoms and multiple biopsies throughout the extent of the colon to assess the microscopic extent of inflammation. Uh, <clears throat> if they just have the proctitis or proctosigmoiditis, um, those are patients are not to be considered at the same risk of IBD, uh, and they can sometimes be managed a little bit differently. 
But if patients have extensive or left-sided colitis, those uh, uh, may actually begin sooner uh, within the first few years. Uh, if we don't see dysplasia after a couple of uh, screening exams, uh, then they can space things out a little bit further, maybe to two to three years. Um, in terms of patients who have other disease manifestations like uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis, those patients also uh, should be uh, uh, screened um, and then potentially followed uh, yearly after that. If there's a, any history of colorectal carcinoma, again, that's gonna change and impact their uh, screening frequency uh, and offer some benefit to them in that situation. Um, ideally, we want these uh, screening biopsies to be performed when the inflammatory changes are, are not flaring, um, when the patient's in remission and well controlled. Um, and so uh, that's um, an important consideration as well. Uh, I always like this one, 33 biopsy specimens, but hopefully not all in the same bottle or in 33 separate bottles. Somewhere in between is probably much better uh, in terms of that. Now, um, if you uh, go across the ocean, um, the uh, recommendations can be a little bit uh, different. Uh, so these are the uh, uh, British Gastroenterology Association recommendations, and I won't spend a great deal of time on that if you're practicing in uh, Great Britain uh, or an area influenced by that uh, association, then you'll need to know those more completely. So that kind of wraps up our, uh, our uh, chronic inflammatory bowel disease section. Let's go on and talk about acute colitis. Um, and notice here that uh, acute colitis uh, is active colitis. Uh, we've got, still got crypt uh, damage and crypt abscess here um, and intraepithelial neutrophils, but we don't have uh, the same degree of architectural distortion, uh, regenerative changes and so forth that we do with uh, chronic disease. Uh, most commonly, this is acute self-limited colitis, and most of these tend to be infectious. Uh, and for that reason, many times uh, gastroenterologists will not uh, biopsy somebody until their uh, uh, symptoms are uh, several months into duration because they really don't feel like uh, they need to biopsy these. Um, if, they, if they look to see if they find something, that's great, uh, but they don't want to potentially push somebody into inflammatory bowel disease uh, because sometimes these things can mimic uh, idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease, especially if they got very many plasma cells and a greater degree of uh, crypt destruction, uh, such as seen here, um, the crypt abscesses. Now, uh, occasionally on uh, random biopsies, you'll see a focal active cryptitis, an isolated crypt, uh, otherwise uninvolved uh, changes in the, in the colonic mucosa. It's not certain that this is uh, really associated with symptomatic disease. It could be resolving acute colitis, Occasionally, it's related to bowel prep. Uh, some uh, children, however, with Crohn's disease can uh, occasionally present with this type of a scattered crypt abscess, focal active cryptitis. Um, and of course, if these are predominantly eosinophils, you want to think about uh, eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Acute hemorrhagic gastritis or colitis, uh, excuse me, uh, colitis. Uh, can be similar to what's seen with the uh, ischemic uh, changes. Here we see this fibrinoid change, uh, leaky vessels, and sort of a glandular atrophy pattern. Uh, this is uh, very similar to what we see with ischemic colitis, where you see a hyalinization and a shrinking glands, maybe dropout, loss of cytoplasm to these uh, cells. Um, usually these are patients who have known cardiovascular disease, but in some young patients, especially those who uh, are stressing themselves uh, with uh, endurance events, and uh, we see those getting longer, farther, and more challenging, uh, you might potentially see uh, um, uh, vascular compromise uh, in patients who've been over uh, hy uh, hypovolemic and uh, stressed in that way. Uh, certain medications could also potentially cause this, and uh, then infection-related uh, changes, uh, of course, go along with this because uh, the, the uh, changes are very similar. 
Now, uh, clostridial colitis uh, is usually recognizable because we get this nice uh, inflammatory cap. But uh, the truth be told that uh, many times in uh, ischemic colitis can also have a little bit of an eruptive appearance. Uh, and then these glands are withering. Uh, the cells are, are dropping out and uh, so forth. And not all cases of clostridial colitis have this exuberant uh, mucinous response. Uh, so uh, while the classic uh, cases uh, do, uh, you may uh, see some overlap. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, in a more chronic case, here we see uh, clostridial colitis very, very closely mimicking ischemic uh, colitis uh, as well. Distribution can be helpful, of course. Um, uh, uh, because uh, ischemic colitis tends to be band-like, whereas clostridial colitis tends to be uh, diffuse and multifocal, but sometimes, or excuse me, multifocal, but sometimes it can become confluent and therefore uh, more challenging to identify as uh, clostridial. Uh, and then, of course, uh, toxigenic uh, bacteria like enterohemorrhagic E. coli can produce a virtually identical appearance, as you see here a little bit of eruptive change, withering glands, fibrinoid changes, uh, vascular congestion, and interstitial hemorrhage uh, are virtually impossible uh, to discriminate, to distinguish from uh, clostridia and uh, ischemic changes. Um, if we think about uh, these the disorders, the, the differential uh, of ischemia infection and radiation colitis uh, can be uh, uh, helped by having a little bit of understanding of uh, where the leash, where the biopsy comes from, uh, watershed zones like the uh, the rectum, distal rectum, or the splenic flexure, uh, and so forth can be uh, important to distinguish. Uh, infections more common in the right uh, colon, whereas radiation uh, usually is left colon and more distal. Um, Withered crypts uh, most uh, prominently seen in ischemia, but can be seen in uh, infection and radiation changes. Fibrinoid thrombi, more commonly with infection. Uh, neutrophils, predominant uh, with uh, infection versus the others. Um, and dilated blood vessels, more commonly seen with radiation uh, than with either of the other two. Um, Lamina propria hyalinization, uh, more common with ischemic uh, disease. So there's a few clues that can help you, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenging diagnosis and best uh, to ensure that clinical correlation is, change, is occurring as well as providing maybe uh, some suggestion from the morphology. Radiation colitis uh, can be both acute as well as a little bit more chronic. Uh, in the acute setting, you can get damage to the glands. You may get vascular damage, some atypia of the nuclei some stromal changes, vascular changes. You see the hyaline change here in the vessels. Uh, <clears throat> dosage is important, um, but uh, certainly by the time they get uh, therapeutic doses of 6,000 gray or six gray, uh, they'll, many will have this complication. Um, and then sometimes uh, you may not see this uh, develop, particularly more, the more chronic sorts with the fibrinoid or hyaline changes uh, until several months uh, post uh, treatment. So moving on to uh, microscopic colitis, uh, this is uh, becoming a more frequently encountered uh, disorder. Uh, this was first recognized and the term coined in 1980 uh, uh, in a group of patients who had chronic diarrhea and essentially a normal colonoscopy and barium enema. Um, but histologically, uh, they had some abnormalities and this were separated into essentially collagenous type colitis versus lymphocytic colitis and uh, maybe uh, some things in between. Collagenous colitis is associated with chronic diarrhea, <clears throat> usually older women, um, and these patients do not have any sort of uh, pseudomembranes or, or cat scratch type of ulcers. Um, there is some association with uh, NSAID disease and celiac disease, um, as well as uh, certain types of uh, uh, antigens from their microbiome. Uh, microscopically, we see this very characteristic epithelial uh, collagenization, as you can see here, just below the surface epithelium. I apologize, this is kind of blown up and a little bit pixelated, uh, but you can see there's a pink zone just beneath the epithelium. In addition, you need to see epithelial damage. Uh, and here, you won't see as much over the crypts directly, but in between the crypts, you should see some degree of loss of cytoplasm. 
Um, and uh, that can be seen nicely here where you see these cells have been uh, shortened a little bit. Uh, the, uh, there is a little bit of uh, a neutrophilic de deposition here. You may see some pycnosis uh, like here, some apoptosis, uh, separation along this cleft. And that's indicative of uh, surface epithelial damage. Uh, and therefore, this qualifies nicely as collagenous colitis. Lymphocytic colitis uh, also is associated with watery diarrhea, but uh, has an equal sex uh, predilection. Uh, this can be uh, strongly uh, associated with celiac disease. Um, and we've uh, done some videos on that, uh, which I'd call your attention to. Uh, it's very uh, likely that you'll have normal architecture. Um, while there is some drug association, uh, and occasionally uh, <clears throat> other disease association. Uh, the key finding here is increased intraepithelial compartment lymphocytes. And what you're seeing here is here's a lymphocyte, here's a lymphocyte, here's a lymphocyte, here's a lymphocyte, here's a lymphocyte. And you're seeing more than one lymphocyte for five epithelial uh, nuclei. Uh, so when you get to that count uh, or you get uh, compulsive about it, you can do that. Uh, if you want to uh, highlight them, you can do a CD3 stain or a, a CD45 uh, stain for uh, uh, lymphocytes uh, that may help you to recognize this. Again, you've got some degree of uh, epithelial damage. Now, uh, apoptotic cells, uh, I, we mentioned that you can see them in uh, um, the uh, collagenous colitis and occasionally in other settings. Uh, but this uh, is uh, also uh, associated in some settings with just bowel preparation, whether something that damages it and causes you to have apoptotic bodies. Most frequently in our practice, we see it uh, due to graft versus host disease. Uh, but other disorders like drugs, uh, chemotherapy agents, mycophenolate, um, and so forth can uh, cause this as well. Uh, associated CMV or uh, HIV infection uh, can cause this as, uh, as well. Um, less commonly seen with IBD, uh, or at least less commonly focused on with those, uh, that disorder. And radiation, of course, can cause uh, apoptosis as well. Diverticular disease uh, occasionally has uh, an associated type colitis um, that, uh, of course, this is usually in older patients who have diverticular disease. And this inflammatory disorder can uh, mimic a sort of mild uh, ulcerative colitis. So here you see the diverticulum, and here's this sort of uh, cryptitis uh, that you see developing. This may be akin to uh, pouchitis or diversion colitis, where you have a diverted uh, fecal stream and the uh, inflammatory response uh, shifts to look a lot like uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and with the fecal stream passing by the, the diverticulum and things are just sitting in here, you can imagine how that sort of uh, uh, scenario could ensue. Now, solitary rectal ulcer, ulcer syndrome, um, essentially part of the prolapse syndromes. Uh, first of all, remember it's not always solitary and it's not always ulcerated. So it has the name uh, and that's the, the classical presentation but it's associated with mucosal prolapse and it can infect or can affect a variety of sites uh, and surfaces in the bowel. Uh, these are usually fairly young, healthy patients, but they may then present with a mass or bleeding. Um, and at times the regenerative atypia that's present here uh, can uh, lead you down the, the garden path to making a diagnosis of adenoma if you are not careful. So there's the pitfall alert. Another entity to be aware of is chronic colitis cystica profunda. Typically, this is, again, a reaction pattern uh, associated with uh, solitary rectal ulcer, ulcer syndrome, uh, straining at stool, prolapse, uh, maybe the prolapse is occurring of the individual crypts and glands into the submucosa uh, or uh, at least uh, deeper into the muscularis mucosa. Um, and of course, the differential here includes uh, mucinous carcinomas or just misplaced glands. Infectious agents, uh, most particularly Yersinia and uh, tubercular disease can also uh, mimic uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, forming granulomas and giving you ulcers, uh, as you see here. 
Um, but usually there's, these are more confluent and associated with some degree of necrosis, a far more prevalent uh, type of granulomatous disease than you usually associated with Crohn's disease. Here's an example of uh, enteric tuberculosis, uh, most commonly seen around the ileocecal valve, um, and uh, certainly a, an endemic population would be uh, more likely to experience this uh, than uh, a more uh, Western uh, developed area. So uh, thinking about the differential between Crohn's disease and one of these uh, inflammatory granulomatous diseases, caseation um, or confluence of the granulomas, these are the features that you don't see in uh, Crohn's disease, uh, whereas there, here you're going to see lots of granulomatous. A lymphoid cuff, very, fairly commonly present, not usually seen in Crohn's disease. Um, ulcerations, not, not helpful. Architectural distortion, not helpful. Um, and uh, multiple sites uh, involved, um, not particularly helpful. Less frequent with Yersinia. Uh, again, tends to be uh, ileocecal area most frequently involved. So uh, one of the challenges, what do we do with chronic colitis with uh, preserved architecture? Where does this fit? Um, if we're seeing predominantly neutrophils, you want to think about infection versus early onset IBD, maybe drug reaction, allergic uh, type drug reaction. If it's predominantly lymphoplasmacytic, well, you may have uh, microscopic colitis or lymphocytic colitis. Um, you might have resolving IBD, diverticular disease less frequently, some drugs, uh, some infections like Shigella and so forth. If you're not seeing any inflammation, just seeing sort of uh, preserved architecture, well, it may be normal. Um, or you could have some other sort of healed injury uh, with uh, just uh, mild changes, quiescent uh, IBD kind of thing. Ischemia also enters into that differential there as well. Uh, this entity called so-called posse cellular colitis, uh, you can see here inflammatory cells within the uh, uh, crypts, uh, not too much crypt destruction or damage other than sort of reactive changes, and the surrounding uh, tissues relatively uh, uh, mildly uh, inflamed. Uh, so you can use the term posse cellular colitis, um, and that may warrant uh, follow-up or further evaluation to determine whether it's infectious or uh, chronic uh, inflammatory bowel disease. I will mention a couple of specific, uh, uh, well, one specific uh, disorder to be aware of, cryptosporidia, easily missed. Um, but uh, if you've got some diarrheal changes or other situations where maybe the patient's immunocompromised, uh, remembering to look for these uh, in, uh, typical organisms uh, within the lumen of the uh, bowel crypts, and obviously not all, but within some, uh, would be uh, worth uh, pursuing. Uh, now, uh, pigmentation in the lamina propria also occasionally presents uh, certain uh, challenges. Uh, you, can have, uh, pseudo you can have melanosis, you can have pseudomelanosis, uh, which is usually related to iron. Uh, true melanosis uh, is, uh, uh, actually, uh, not usually uh, melanin. Uh, it's a melanin-like pigment um, that doesn't stain with uh, uh, melanin uh, or melanocytic uh, markers, uh, but it is PS positive and acid fast positive um, and differentiates uh, from uh, lipofusion. Um, brown bowel syndrome, again, uh, this is uh, quite uncommon. Um, and uh, I have no experience with that, so I won't really comment about that. Uh, barium can occasionally give you more of a gray uh, situation. We don't use barium quite as much anymore, so that's uh, decreasing in frequency. Uh, and then chronic granulomatous disease can have sort of a golden brown uh, macrophage um, that uh, would be uh, positive. So here's a nice example of melanosis coli. This is uh, not an H and E stain, but you can see the uh, brownish pigment here um, in the uh, lamina propria uh, macrophages. 
Other things in the lamina propria that you might encounter, xanthoma cells, mucophages, um, histiocytes with uh, mycobacterium, atypical mycobacterium, especially in uh, um, uh, susceptible individuals. Malacoplakia occasionally can involve the GI tract. Uh, granular cell tumor, uh, more common, more proximally, but uh, rarely has been seen uh, further on. Signet ring cell carcinomas, clear cell carcinoid tumors, uh, also rarely situation in this situation. And uh, we might add here um, the uh, presence of um, well, I'm blocking here, so I, we won't add here. <laughs> we'll just go on. All right, well, that brings us to the end. Hopefully there are some questions. We welcome your questions and I'd be pleased to deal with those. Either put them in the comments below or uh, connect with me via the uh, uh, Twitter or uh, email uh, noted below. And if you like this, we certainly hope that you'll subscribe and uh, share it with others. Um, we've intended to sort of provide this as sort of basics for board review and other sorts of things that may be helpful to trainees. Um, and so until next time, thanks for joining us.